had a spiritual bacteria at loose in our bodies, in our lives. But somewhere along the line, we met Jesus. And when he touched us, we discovered that his love superseded our dysfunction. His grace superseded our mistakes. Come on. His mercy superseded all the things that we have done wrong in life. And we stood up, discovered he gave us the gift of a new beginning. Everybody shout, Christ is risen. risen. Come on, let's celebrate that. That's great news. (laughs) Hallelujah. Let me uh, just tell you where our two passages will be coming from today, and then I've got a little announcement to make as you look uh, for them. The first is the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. Only one verse, verse 30. And the second is... 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Be reading from the New International Version. But as you look for those uh, passages, let me just uh, make uh, another announcement. Uh, since we take extremely serious here the call that is on us to reach those who are far from God and help them to become enthusiastic, lifelong followers of Jesus Christ, I want to celebrate uh, this good news. On last weekend, when all of the gatherings were completed and all of the cards were processed, we had 50 people to take their next step in following Jesus Christ. Praise God. 40 of, 42 of them uh, said, I'm ready to be a follower of Jesus. Another eight of them said, I'm ready to be baptized. Isn't that just fantastic news? Celebrate that again. Praise God. Uh, With that, uh, let me just say to those of you who are with us for the first time, uh, there are a lot of different ways to honor and to show our respect for Scripture. One of the ways that we demonstrate that Scripture is the highest authority in our lives uh, is that when we read the Word of God, we stand. And so I'm going to invite everyone to stand as we get ready to read the Scripture today. First John chapter 19, verse 30. Jesus is dying on the cross. Listen to what he says. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Everybody say that. It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit and died. And then 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Listen to what Peter said. Uh, Jesus' closest disciple, the apostle that became the leader of the church when he, Jesus was resurrected and ascended. Here's what Peter writes. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy. Everybody say great mercy. Great mercy. He has given us new birth into, watch this, a living hope. Say that. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There ends our reading. People of God say amen. Amen. Please be seated. God, we thank you for this time to share your word. We thank you for the gift of being alive and the gift of health and strength that is reasonable enough for us to come here. You know that I have in and of myself nothing of substance to offer So take this broken piece of flesh that I am, and despite all my inadequacies, work a miracle and fill me with your spirit. You know I say this all the time, but you know how much I mean it. And work a miracle, Lord, because that's what it is. And bring a word to your people that will cause us to leave transformed and invigorated to follow you, both your people and the preacher. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 It is finished. I want you to shout this subject with me. It's really a question that we're asking. Shout this. Do you get it? Say it. Do you get it? One more time. Shout it. Do you get it? This morning on uh, Easter Sunday, I want to start with a brand new series called Let Hope In. 
It's really taken from a book that's written by a preacher by the name of Pete Wilson. It's with the same title, and I encourage you to go and get the book. It's an extraordinarily, it's a wonderful uh, book, well-written, great insight. For the next eight weeks, we're going to follow. Pete argues in that book basically uh, two things. One, uh, that uh, broken life has broken all of us. And from time to time, the pain that comes from that brokenness is not well digested by us. And it has a peculiar way of kind of being regurgitated, if you will, and spilling out in our today. So that at the end of the day, our past has not quite passed. And Peter argues that there are four choices that we get to make every day that in fact helps us to get beyond that challenge. And I'm going to look this week and next week at the first choice that we get to make. And I'm going to try to help us to figure out how to do it. Here's the choice. Here's, here's how Pete Wilson frames it. If you don't transform your pain, you will transfer your pain. So the choice that we have to make every day is to be engaged with being aware of our pain and be in the process of transforming it, or we will transfer it to others. Now, Jesus says on the cross, four gospel writers all captured Jesus. He makes seven final uh, phrases or statements on the cross, which we call the seven last words. This is the sixth of the seven. He says, it is is finished. What's the it? What's the it that he's referring to that's finished? Well, as you contemplate that question, let me ask you two other questions. What is the all-consuming it that you're pursuing every day? What's the it that causes you to work so many hours? What's the it that causes you after having already acquired two or three degrees, you're going after two or three more educational degrees? Not that that's bad. I'm just simply asking, what's the it? What's the it that has caused you to have a closet of more than 100 pairs of shoes? I'm not saying that's bad. I I just want to know what's the it that you're pursuing that would do that? What's what's the it that causes you to feel like you have to purchase the most recent new gadget or buy the biggest TV? What's the it you are in pursuit of? What's that? Now, I've got a third question. What's, because some of you say, well, I'm I'm not pursuing it. Well, here's, here's, here's your question. What's the inescapable it that you're trying to get away from? What's the it you thought you had buried, but it keeps coming back to life? You thought you had buried, but it keeps coming back to life. And because of it, you, uh, you, what, you work too much, you party too much, you eat too much, you shop too much, you drive too fast. What's the it? What is it? Well, let me offer you two possible answers. In lieu of the first question, the it that we pursue, let me suggest that for many of us, that it that we are pursuing is significance. Everybody say significance. Its equivalent word is value. We are serious about acquiring and trying to earn value, value that cannot be deleted by someone pushing a button from our lives, value, value that will not be erased after we die from the history that says that we are here. We are, some of us, in pursuit of value, significance. That's why we work so many hours. I have so many shoes in our closet. 
What's the it we're trying to escape from, trying to get away from? What's the it that we're trying to bury, but it keeps coming back, bury, but it keeps coming back? Uh, let me suggest that for some of us, that it is shame. Everybody say shame. shame. And Pete Wilson defines shame as uh, the feeling that we are unacceptable because of what we've done or because of what's been done to us. I, I define it this way. It's the feeling that comes as a result of you and, you and me having done the unthinkable or having the unthinkable done to us. And what's unique about, about shame is it steals our sense of value. And if you feel insignificant, you're more likely to move into shame-feeling behavior. <clears throat> That's it. Let me share with you three quick stories. First one is a story that Pete Wilson shares himself. He says as a young woman, he's a pastor in Tennessee, he says a young woman by the name of Kim who gets a pastoral counseling uh, session with him, she comes in the counseling session and she starts off by saying, my life is a wreck. And then, and I, he's an honest pastor, so he, he thought, like, he, he writes this. He says, he was thinking, well, join the club. But uh, he, 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 she goes on to say, she goes on to say, uh, first of all, before I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I want you to know I'm a good person. And then she said, well, I'm not actually a good person, but I really love God. And I'm really trying to do right. And then she lays out that for the last 18 months, within an 18-month period of time, she had been in three uh, sexual relationships with three different men. Two of them had been married at the time. And she said, why do I keep doing this over and over again? Why do I keep hurting the people around me? Why do I keep hurting myself? You see, if you don't transform the pain, you transfer it. <clears throat> and upon further investigation, we discovered that, in fact, she grew up in a fairly affluent home, and her father was so busy, he never paid attention to her. And so she, she grew up feeling a sense of shame that she wasn't worth getting her father's attention. And the first guy that she had an affair with was her boss, and she fell into that affair because he actually just paid attention to her. Seeking significance, being driven by Shame. She ends the session in tears. She had done the unthinkable, and in her mind, she had become the unthinkable. Let me tell you another story. This one is about Peter. He's the one who writes First Peter. He says, you know, we read it. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy. Everybody say great mercy. We have new birth into a living hope that has come through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's remarkable that Peter would write these words. Because if you go to the end of uh, Peter, 1 Peter, if you go to the last chapter, the last verse, you'll note that he, he talks about a young man named Mark, his spiritual son. And most scholars think that the gospel of Mark was... Uh, a, a gospel written by Mark, dictated to by Peter, an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. And so I can imagine Peter dictating this gospel to Mark. I can, I can see Peter saying, uh, uh, listen, I was fishing. I was just a country fisherman. And Jesus, this famous fellow, passed by and said, come follow me and I'll make you fishermen of people. And in a moment, I recognized if I go with him, I could get significance. And I dropped my poles and went. I can hear him talking to Mark uh, and saying, but the problem is that not so long after that, Jesus changed my name. I'm the only one of the apostles whose name was changed. I, I, I was called Simon when I was born. But Jesus says, I'm no longer going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter, Petros, which means rock. So every time we say Peter in translation, what you're saying is rock. And Peter would say, I really hated when Jesus would call me rock because it, it, it reflected his expectation. And I knew that I wasn't a rock, but I didn't want him to know I wasn't a rock. 
But I can see him as he's dictating the mark. He's saying, but the problem with me is I kept trying to be the rock that I knew that I wasn't without him knowing that I wasn't what I, he thought that I was. I just kept messing up. Yeah, I, I can see him talking to me. He can say, look, I had the tendency, I'd speak up when I was supposed to be quiet. And, you know, Mark chapter 9 talks about the fact that Jesus in, his, in the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, revealed his divinity. It was a high holy moment. And Elijah and Moses, all of them showed up there. And everybody was, shh. And Peter went, maybe we ought to build a couple of guys. Shh. <laughs> this is a holy moment. <laughs> Peter, I can see him dictating. He said, I had it. I just keep messing up. I just keep messing up. I had a tendency to sleep when I was supposed to be praying. Right. <clears throat> Chapter 14, Jesus says to the disciples, Peter, James, and John, in the garden of Gethsemane, you wait here with me. Y'all wait and pray. I'm going to go over here and pray. And Jesus came back three times. Each time, Peter was asleep, blowing Z's. Peter said, I don't know. He called me a rock, I, I, but I knew I wasn't a rock. I just didn't want him to know, but I just, some, I just kept messing up. He said, finally, 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 uh, I, 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 I have a tendency to cut you first and ask questions later. <laughs> you know, in chapter 14 of Mark, and John identifies as Peter, uh, the, the fellas come to arrest Jesus. And when they come to arrest Jesus, Peter said, oh, no, you don't, man. He was packing, y'all. He had a blade. He was <laughs> Cut the man ear off. Jesus said, wait. <laughs> you pack it. <laughs> Peter said, what really messed me up, though, I kept trying. I knew I wasn't a rock. He kept calling me rock, but I wasn't rock. But this one time, I thought I could be a rock. It was after the, the Passover. We were out. And Jesus looked at us and he said, uh, within a few hours, all of you are going to abandon me. And I said to him, oh, no. I knew that. The, I knew what I was talking about here. On this occasion, I could be a rock. And I said to him, no, no, no. I will never abandon you. And then he looked at me, Jesus did, with tears in his eyes. And tenderly he said to me, Peter. Rock, before the rooster crows twice tonight, you will disown me three times. It cut me to my core. I said, no, and I meant this. I wasn't joking. I said, no, if I have to die, I'll die with you. But then they arrested him, and fear arrested me, Peter says. And I followed at a distance, and a little girl saw me in the courtyard as I was trying to see what was happening. She said, oh, you're one of the Galileans. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. You're one of the Nazarene. I said, no, 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 no. I don't know what you're talking about. Not, no, not me. And then a little later on, I was getting out in the courtyard, and she saw me again. She told somebody, that's one of those, uh, uh, his, his followers. He's, she, he's a Galilean. I, I, no, I'm not a Galilean. I don't know him. I, well, what you talking about? And then finally, so everybody came over and they said, no, you're one, you're one. And, 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 and the text says, Peter started calling down curses. In other words, he cursed folk out. <laughs> and he finishes by saying, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. And the rooster crowed twice. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus. And he collapsed in tears. And in that very moment, Peter had done the unthinkable, and he had become the unthinkable. How could I have done that? I can't believe it. I'm worthless. Now, let me tell you a final story. This one's about me. Not Kim or Peter, but me. 25 years ago, this year. I had an important appointment with a big influential pastor in San Francisco. I'd been 
through everything to get this appointment. I was in seminary. I wanted to do a paper because he had a kind of ministry I wanted to model. It was a ministry that was seriously Christ-centered, but it impacted the community. And I wanted to interview him, talk to him. And so we had gone through a lot, got the interview. This was the day of the meeting. I got dressed. I was looking good. And I went on. My, my god sister Iris picked me up. And we got there to the church, and we're standing on the steps of the church getting final instructions. And she took a look at me, and she started screaming. <laughs> I said, Iris, what's wrong with you? She said, Herman, look down. And I looked, and everything was in place. She said, look down. I looked down. She said, Herman, you got to miss my shoes. <laughs> one black one, one brown one. <laughs> now, y'all, this is a true story. This is y'all pastor right here. Praise God. Thank God for these other preachers on the team. Hallelujah. <laughs> y'all, I had on miss my shoes. You can imagine how I must have felt when I went on into that big meeting. And I knocked on the door, and he opened, he said, come on in. And I'm thinking, here, here, don't look down, here, here. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. <laughs> come on now, I sit down, and I put my feet as far under the desk as I could. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, don't let him look down, don't let him look down, don't let him see my mismatched shoes. And I told y'all, I told y'all that I grew up in, I went through special education. In that very moment, I felt like I was that little boy back in special education. And I started to try to overcompensate. I talked louder. Because I really felt like being over in the corner, being quiet. I, I tried to be a little smarter than I typically was because I really was feeling not so smart. I, I tried to be more charming because I really felt like a chump. And I'm thinking, please don't look under the table. Because if you do, you'll discover my secret. I got on mismatch shoes. And here's what's remarkable about it. I know you want to know how did I put those shoes on. <laughs> it was my wife's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me tell you what happened. what happened. I knew I had that meeting that morning. But my wife, she's a, a soft sleeper. She don't like to be awakened. She, she, don't, don't wake her up. And so I got dressed outside of the room, but my shoes was in the room and it was dark. And so I got in the room and I just filled around. I knew that if I had the right shoes could work because I, if I put my foot in and it fit, that's the right shoe. So I put it in and it fit. I'm in the dark, y'all. I put the other one in, and it fit. And I walked out just knowing I was all right. But I had on mismatched shoes. Y'all, Peter, when he did the unthinkable, he had on mismatched shoes. Kim, when she confessed what she had done with those two married men, she had on mismatched shoes. The fact is, a lot of y'all who showed up here today, you don't know it, but you walked in here with mismatched shoes. You've got a secret. You're saying to us, I, 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 don't look down, don't look down. Look at my hair. Look at my clothes. Look at my credentials. Look at what I drive. But please don't look too far down. You'll discover there is something in my life that I'm ashamed of. You'll discover that there's an unthinkableness that I don't want you to see. Please don't look down. And just like I put those shoes on in the dark, listen, we always put on our mismatched shoes in the dark. The unthinkable things that we do always happens in the dark. The unthinkable things that are done to us that steal our sense of value always usually happens in the dark. And yet it looks like it fit because we feel like we are not fit. We feel like we are not worthy. We feel like we are not good enough. We feel like we oughtn't be in the room. We feel like we really shouldn't be here today. We just don't fit. And that feeling of not fitting fits. Peter. 
and faded. And now he's hiding. Like a lot of us here today, we're hiding. You can be in a big corporate office and still hide. Come on now. You can be among your friends and still hide. Come on. You can be with your spouse and still hide. When you keep that part of yourself because you're afraid if he, she, they know, I won't be lovable. I won't have value. And Peter was hiding along with the other disciples in this room. But then somebody came and knocked on the door and said, he's dead. And Peter said, I, I, I'm so, I feel so bad. He said, did you hear the last word? He said, six, what? He said, it is finished. And then he died. Peter, what do you think it meant? Peter, I don't know what it meant. I thought I was going to be a world changer. Here I am, a would-be revolutionary head, afraid in this room. And then another knock. Boom, 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 boom. I opened the door. Two days later, women ecstatic. Peter, he's alive. Who? Jesus. What? He's risen. What's wrong with y'all? No. We went there this morning. The stone was rolled away. We went in. There was an angel sitting there. And the angel said, why do you search for him who is alive among the dead? He's not here. He has risen as he said. And in that very moment, the women said, we recognize that there was more to Jesus than flesh. There was the divine. Come on now. There was more to Jesus. Come on now than just humanity. God was there. And it was God that woke up. Y'all ain't listening. And the stone rolled away. And he walked out. And by the way, Peter, he said to tell his disciples and you yeah. with your mismatched shoes yeah. to come meet him in Galilee. Y'all ain't listening. Peter runs to the tomb. John runs to the tomb. Uh, John gets there first. Peter goes in. The stuff is folded neatly. Doesn't see nobody. And, and all of the gospel writers hint that somewhere between there and Jesus showing up in that room with the locked door, somewhere between there and Jesus showing up on the beach, come on now, and with a fish that was recorded by Luke, somewhere between there and then Jesus and Peter had an encounter. They all hint at it. We don't know where it was. But in my mind, I think since the, 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 the tomb was not far from Gethsemane, I think Peter probably went by himself to the last place where he remembered him, to the last place where he had done the unthinkable. And I think he was there in the midst of tears and brokenness and confused in his mismatched shoes. What's the it that Jesus meant when he said, it's finished. My son, Jonathan, as we get ready to wrap it up, when my baby girl was growing up, she had a pacifier that we couldn't lose. <laughs> when my boy was growing up, he had a bear. We called him Mr. Bear. He, 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 from our perspective, he didn't have no value. We didn't even buy him. Somebody handed him down. He was a hand-me-down, worn-out bear when we got him. But there was a connection between Jonathan and Mr. Bear. And, and Jonathan loved Mr. Bear. I mean so much so that if he couldn't find Mr. Bear, we'd be late for church because we couldn't leave till we found Mr. Bear. So much so that if we left a hotel and got an hour away, but Jonathan didn't have Mr. Bear and discovered we had to turn around and go back to the hotel and make sure we found Mr. Bear. My wife sold up Mr. Bear. So many patches, blue and red and all that. But that's all right. He was Mr. Bear. Now I learned something. Value is not necessarily intrinsic. On Mr. Bear's own, he was worthless. But because Jonathan loved him, if somebody had offered a million dollars, Jonathan would have turned, I wouldn't have, but Jonathan would have turned it down. 
<laughs> Jonathan would have turned it down because Mr. Bear was priceless. Oh, I believe that when Peter was in that garden of Gethsemane, there was a tap. And he looked up and he saw him who was dead now alive. And, and I, I, think, I think Jesus said to him, Peter, I know you got mismatched shoes. I know you're feeling guilty. I know you got shame all in your life. I know you're embarrassed to see me. I know you think you don't fit among the apostles. I know you think you've kicked yourself out of my divine plan. But I came to tell you, you're my Mr. Bear. Come on now. Peter. You've been looking for your value in creation. You've been looking for your value in things and your job. Uh, come on now. But, 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 but I'm telling you that when I died on the cross, I had you in mind. And when I died on the cross, I loved you. That's why Peter would ultimately write this in chapter 2, verse, uh, 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 chapter two verse 22. He says this. He says, uh, he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here's the point. Sin means missing the mark. Here's the lesson. Anytime you look for your ultimate value in things, in creation, you've missed the mark. If you look for your ultimate value in how much you work, you've missed the mark. In your clothes, you've missed the mark. Come on, in your car, you've missed the mark. Jesus says, I'm going to take your shame, come on, your sin, and I'm going to give you my righteousness. And that's my way of saying I'm transferring your value. I'm going to move it from what you did and from what is around you, and I'm going to put it in my love. Come on now. And I'm going to protect it from anything you can do to mess it up. I'm going to protect it from anything anybody else can do to you to mess it up. As long as I exist, and that's for eternity, you will have an eternal priceless value. What's the it? Jesus says, it is finished. What's the it? Let me tell you what the it is. The it, when Jesus said, you're my Mr. Bear, he then said, guess what? I brought you a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Come on now. They're called shoes of redemption. Y'all ain't listening. Come on back. Pull off your mismatched shoes. Come on now. Come on now. I, these shoes were specially made. I, I shed my blood to make these shoes. Come on. Come on. The soul has my forgiveness. Come on. The, 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 the leather around it has my righteousness. And I put a special pattern inside. It's called my great mercy. Y'all ain't listening. Put on my, oh, y'all, put on new shoes. Put on your shoes, your shoes of redemption. Come on. Come on. All you got to do is recognize it, accept it, and then put it on. And next time you start working too hard to get some value, look at your new shoes. Remind you you're valued in Christ. The next time you start eating too much, because of the shame, look at your shoes. Remember when he said it's finished, the shame is over. Come on now. Your value is secure. Ah, oh, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Good. So put on your new shoes. Walk out of this church in great mercy. Go to your job standing in great mercy. <laughs> Go on your next date standing in great mercy. Fall, don't worry about it. Get up in great mercy. Wear your new shoes. Shout hallelujah. Glory. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? He's got new shoes for you, shaped out of great mercy, a living hope. Do you get it? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God.